I'm Mackenzie. And I'm Madison. And we're graduate students in the counseling program at the University of Central Oklahoma. Today we'll be talking to you about dialectical behavior therapy, specifically for adolescents with non-suicidal self-injury. Before we begin, it's important to note that DBT is an extremely intricate and lengthy therapy, so for our purposes, we have broken it down to the basics. A commonly used definition to describe non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI, is the deliberate, repeated, self-inflicted destruction to the body tissue. Some common methods are skin cutting, head banging, hitting, burning, and scratching. Although there are other methods used, these are the ones that we typically see the most. This is in contrast to a suicide attempt. There is no intent in an SSI, and the intent is what separates an SSI from an actual suicide attempt. Non-suicidal self-injury is not an actual diagnosis included in the DSM-5. There was a proposed criteria made for it when the authors were reviewing the fourth edition, and that includes the following criteria. So in the last year, the individual has on five or more days engaged in intentional self-inflicted damage to the surface of their body with the expectation that the injury will lead to only minor or moderate physical harm. There's no suicidal intent involved. Also, the individual engages in the self-injurious behavior with one or more of the following expectations. So, to obtain relief from a negative feeling or cognitive state, to resolve any interpersonal difficulties, or to induce a positive feeling state. Also, the intentional self-injury is associated with at least one of the following. Interpersonal difficulties or negative feelings or thoughts. Prior to engaging in the act, there's a period of preoccupation with the in intended behavior that is difficult for the individual to control, and also the individual thinks about the self-injury occurring frequently even when it's not acted, up, acted upon. Also, the behavior is not socially sanctioned and is not restricted to picking a scab or nail biting. The behavior and its consequences must cause clinically significant distress or impairment in important areas of functioning. And the behavior does not occur during states of psychosis, delirium, intoxication, and it, is, it cannot be accounted for by another mental or medical disorder. NSSI is often comorbid with other disorders, such as borderline personality disorder, depression, anxiety, and many more. The prevalence in adolescents has become sort of an epidemic over the past several years, with rates continuing to rise in this population. Currently, the prevalence rates of diagno meeting diagnostic criteria is 15.9 to 18 percent. The onset is typically between the ages of 11 and 15. This reaches a peak during middle adolescence and continues on to about 4% in adulthood. There is a higher female to male ratio being 3 to 1. Females are more prone to these behaviors. Females also are more likely to engage in methods such as cutting, whereas males are more likely to engage in burning, hitting, and punching. There are many reasons why adolescents engage in NSSI behaviors. Some of these include influencing the behaviors of others, regulating their own emotions to calm themselves down, relieving themselves from distressful feelings such as sadness, guilt, depersonalization, or flashbacks, also emotional escape or avoidance, and self-punishment also. Attention could possibly be um, another reason for this behavior, but we have to be extremely careful before we jump to this conclusion. Also, um, the adolescent may partake in these behaviors as a form to cry out for help to other people just so they can let them know how bad they really are feeling. Also, um, participating in this behavior to make the individual feel something. So oftentimes, adolescents report that they have feelings of numbness or emptiness, and they engage in this behavior in order to make them experience some sort of emotions. Also, the adolescent may do it to make them feel as if they are in control and as a form of social acceptance among their peers. So now we're gonna go into exactly what dialectical behavior therapy is. It was developed in the 1970s by Marsha Linhan and was originally used with highly suicidal and highly self-injurious populations. It was then 
widely used with borderline personality patients in the adult population. It since then has been modified to treat many other disorders, including NSSI in adolescents. One crucial part of DBT is that it treats the behaviors of the NSSI first rather than treating the possible underlying disorder, such as perhaps major depressive disorder. Instead of focusing on the disorder, it addresses the behaviors first. There have been some adaptations made to DBT specifically for the adolescent population, and that was done by Miller and Rathis. First and foremost, the process of DBT was shortened from one year to 16 weeks, and that was due to the adolescent's short attention span. Also, the parents are involved throughout the entire therapy process. Handouts and activities have also been ad adapted to be age appropriate for the adolescent, and the addition of the fifth skills module was also included, and that is specifically directed towards parents and adolescents. Dialectics is a philosophy in which you examine and discuss opposing ideas to find the truth somewhere in the middle. Specific to DBT, this is the balance between change and acceptance. You work on changing one's maladaptive behaviors while learning to accept the situation and the circumstances that you are in. It is impossible to work on change without being able to temporarily tolerate the pain, which is where the acceptance comes in. So the behavioral component to DBT involves changing those maladaptive behaviors through group skills training. Interpersonal effectiveness skills and emotional regulation skills are two of the groups that are taught and they are both change oriented. Distress tolerance skills and core mindfulness skills are two of the other groups and these groups are focused on acceptance rather than change. DBT is based off of the biosocial theory and that consists of two factors emotional dysregulation and invalidating environments. Emotional dysregulation consists of emotional vulnerability combined with difficulties regulating emotional reactions. Invalidating environment consists of controlling or not properly reacting to displays of emotions or attributing those behaviors to normal teenage behavior. In DBT, there are four modes of therapy. These modes include individual therapy, group skills training, phone consultation, and consultation team, as well as family sessions that can be held on an as-needed basis. Individual therapy is held in weekly sessions, typically 50 to 60 minutes long. Group skills trainings are also weekly and are about two hours long. There are five different modules for the group skills training that are gone over throughout the 16 weeks of treatment. Phone consultation is a cool tool to use for DBT. It is on an as-needed basis and it's where the client can call the therapist at any time that they want to share either good news or in times of health. So this can be used as a, a crisis intervention or a way for the therapist to help the client use whatever tools they've learned to help them as well as an opportunity to share good news and good things that are happening so that these these phone calls aren't all negative. The consultation team consists of a group of DBT therapists who meet together and discuss any difficulties that, the, that they may be having or experiencing with a particular client. This is sort of a group therapy for the therapists themselves. DBT consists of a pre-treatment stage as well as four subsequent stages of treatment. For the purposes of treating NSSI, we'll be we will be focusing on the pre-treatment stage as well as stage one, whereas stages two through four are mainly focusing on maintaining those behaviors that have been learned. So for the pre-treatment stage, that usually consists of two to three sessions, and the purpose of the pre-treatment stage is to inform the client, the therapist, and the client's family um, about the process of DBT and bring them together and prepare them to work together. Also. Um, commitments are made during the pre-treatment stage and allows the client as well as their family to know what to expect from DBT and this serves as an avenue to get commitment from all parties. The purpose of stage one is to attain a life pattern that is reasonably functional and stable. 
And we focus on four targets during stage one. The first one is decreasing life-threatening behaviors. So those may be suicide, suicidal ideations, suicide attempts. For our purposes, um, it's non-suicidal self-injury. The second target is decreasing therapy interfering behaviors. So those can be behaviors from the therapist, the client, or family members. So for the client, maybe they are showing up late to therapy or not coming to therapy. Um, in regards to their family members, maybe they're not bringing their adolescent to sessions on time or they're just not participating. The third target is decreasing quality of life, interfering behaviors. So those may consist of behaviors such as substance abuse or interpersonal difficulties or difficulties with um, relationships, things like that. And the fourth target is increasing behavioral skills, and that is done through group skills training. And all of the targets except decreasing therapy interfering behaviors are recorded and tracked on a diary card each week, and that is in individual therapy. Diary cards are an important part to individual therapy and DBT. They are used to determine the relevance of targeted behaviors. They are filled out and brought to weekly sessions. Failure to complete or bring in to session is considered a therapy interfering behavior. The client records daily instances of target behaviors such as non-suicidal self-injury, urges to commit suicide or NSSI, use of behavioral skills, and additional targeted behaviors if needed. Now we're going to go into a brief overview of the group modules included in DBT, and the first one is Distress Tolerance, and this module teaches adolescents coping skills that they can use to survive painful emotions or situations that they may be experiencing instead of engaging in maladaptive or harmful behaviors such as non-suicidal self-injury, and this module is especially important for adolescents due to their developmental level. Some of the coping skills taught in this module are distraction, self-soothing, and improving the moment. This is an acceptance-based approach that helps clients focus on being okay with who they are and where they're at in life. Another acceptance-based module is the core mindfulness skills, and this technique is used throughout all modes of therapy, and this teaches the adolescents what they can do when they become emotionally overwhelmed. So one thing that they can do is being one mindful, so focusing on one thing at a time during that moment or situation. Another aspect they can use is recognizing non-judgmental thoughts about the experience, and they can also learn how to make healthy life decisions in order to achieve their goals. So another acceptance-based module is the core mindfulness skills, and this technique is used throughout all modes of therapy, and this teaches adolescents what they can do when they become emotionally overwhelmed. So one thing they can do is becoming one mindful, so focusing on one emotion during the experience, Another thing they can do is recognizing non-judgmental thoughts about the experience. And a third thing they can do is making healthy decisions that they can use in order to achieve their goals. The following is a demonstration of a mindfulness exercise that can be used throughout therapy. The exercise is called sound ball. It involves one group member throwing a sound across the room to another member. That member then catches the same sound by repeating it exactly and then throws a new sound to someone else and so on with a new sound each time. The aspect of mindfulness taught in this exercise is observing and participating one mindfully. Work. Blah, blah. Blah, blah.
From the demonstration, you can see how each member is focused on repeating the sound from the previous member and then making up their own sound. While the members are engaged in the activity, they aren't thinking about anything else, therefore being one mindful. Now we're going to briefly go over change-based group skills. So one of those skills includes interpersonal effectiveness skills, and that teaches the adolescent how to say no while maintaining respect. Also, it teaches how the adolescent can be assertive as well as how they can handle conflict effectively with other individuals. The next is emotional regulation skills. This helps clients regulate painful affective states by learning about their emotions, such as the functions of these emotions and how to identify and label them, as well as being mindful of them. So the third skill is walking the middle path, and this was specifically added for adolescents and their families. And the primary focus is on the parent and adolescent interactions. And this promotes the balance between acceptance and change skills, and also focuses on issues that are particularly important to the adolescent and their families, such as parenting styles. We hope this video has been helpful. As we mentioned earlier, DBT is an extremely complex and lengthy therapy. For more information on DBT, you can refer to the following resources we have provided. Thank you for watching.